By the end of episode 2, we had seen how Edward III, before his death in 1377, had pretty much re-established monarchical control over the papacy in England. However, his son and heir, the Black Prince, Edward of Woodstock, had died, taken by dysentery in June the previous year. The new king, then, was the Black Prince's son, Edward's grandson. He was Richard of Bordeaux, who became King Richard II. At the time, Richard was ten years old, a little on the youngish side, maybe, for a king. So, enter John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. John of Gaunt was the third son of Edward III, and so Richard's uncle. Lionel, the second son, had died some years earlier, and it was John of Gaunt who would come to dominate Richard's Regency Council for much of the reign. For a decade or so after Edward's death, relations between the monarchy and the papacy were, well, they, they tolerated each other. Much of Christendom was suffering the aftermath of the Black Death. Ramifications of a massive decline in the population created a labour shortage, and so a higher tax burden on those who survived, not least to pay for the war in France. Social and economic tensions had evolved, developed and burgeoned and multiplied until control was lost. Because one day, on the 30th of May 1381 to be exact, a royal officer was collecting the hated poll tax. And well, he seems to have rubbed someone or another up the wrong way. Why? Because there was a great bang and suddenly the kingdom was up in arms. The peasants revolted kicked off, plus some. These were the poll tax riots. What Tyler, Jack Straw and John Ball were at the forefront of it. And their fellow rebels set about wrecking anything and everything they could get hold of. Gone of Gaunt's Savoy Palace was ransacked. Prison gates were burst open. The Archbishop of Canterbury and many others parted company with their heads, which were impaled on spikes around London. All in all, it was a rough old time. But amongst other things, it was the end of the poll tax. Well, the end of the poll tax for a few hundred years. By 1390, however, another rift with the papacy culminated in the Second Statute of Provisors, and as a consequence, English papal relations were bollocksed. The Pope unleashed a papal bull in the direction of the King of England. He denounced and annulled all the acts passed in the English Parliament that were disagreeable to him. These were the Acts of 1390, along with its predecessors of 1307 and 1351. The bull was tethered to the door of St. Peter's in Rome. There was something, however, of a paradox, because when the bull arrived in England, it was kept under wraps, because it couldn't be published in England, because to do so was a contravention of the 1390 statue, which the bull was intended to annul. And in 1393, the great statute of Premier, again put forward by the Commons, came with another almighty blast against the Pope, a blast that was still resonating as the Reformation Parliament assembled in 1529. 140 years later, the resonation of that statute was finally subdued by the Act in Restraint of Appeals, the severance from Rome in the legislation penned by Thomas Cromwell in 1533, when royal supremacy over the church was stamped almost indelibly onto the statute book. But what the Reformation Parliament of the 16th century achieved 
very nearly happened in 1410. There were plans afoot laid by one Sir John Oldcastle and his cohorts in the reign of Henry V to bring about the reforms that Thomas Cromwell and his cohorts did realise in the reign of Henry VIII. The 14th century was one of the most remarkable in the history of Christendom. It began with the first mass production printing press. The printing capabilities facilitated the widespread distribution of news, information and opinion more effectively than ever known before. The 14th century also produced John Wycliffe, the vehemently outspoken critic of the Roman Catholic Church. His theology by way of Richard II and his Queen, Anne of Bohemia, found its way back through the Western universities east to what is now the Czech Republic in the former Kingdom of Bohemia. There, Wycliffe's teachings were embraced by the theologian and philosopher Jan Hus, who was Master Dean and Rector of the University of Prague. Hus was at the forefront of a band of anti-clerical anti-papists who instigated the Bohemian Reformation and the Bohemian Wars, otherwise known as the Hussite Revolution against the Catholic forces of the Holy Roman Empire and the papacy. Throughout the century, ill sentiment towards the Roman Catholic Church ever increased, with the so-called Lollard movement, particularly in England, of which Sir John Oncastle, who hailed from the Welsh marches, was probably the most prominent member. Castle and Huss established a secure means of communication between England and Bohemia. They worked together to bring down the Roman Catholic Church throughout Christendom. Sir John Oldcastle was also a friend and comrade of young Henry of Monmouth, who later became King Henry V of England. The two fought together in the war with Wales, and notably against the Welsh military commander, Owen Glendower. Now, both Richard and his regent, John of Gaunt, made no secret of their Lollard sympathies. We may wonder if Henry of Monmouth at least empathised at some point with the Lollard movement. This future king, Prince Hal, grew up in that hotbed of Lollardy, the Welsh marches with Old Castle, and the Lollard philosophy, which was so prevalent in the Borgia region. In 1395, 12 conclusions of the Lollard anti-clerical sentiment were presented to Parliament, and the text was nailed to the doors of Westminster Abbey and St Paul's Cathedral. Then, in 1397, King Richard II exiled the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Arundel, from the Kingdom. The following year, King Richard banished Henry of Monmouth's father, Henry Bolingbroke, the future Henry IV, from the kingdom. The two of them, while outcasts in France, joined forces. Well, not so much joined forces. Arundel was the leader. The two returned to England in 1399 and ousted, usurped, some say, King Richard II. Bolingbroke became King Henry IV and Arundel returned to Canterbury. Archbishop Arundel and King Henry IV's relationship was not unlike Archbishop Wolsey and King Henry VIII's relationship. In both instances, the Archbishop ruled the King and ruled his kingdom. The return of the Archbishop poured more fuel onto the anti-clerical fire. Arundel hit back and began a purge. Many Lollards were executed. 
But then the anti-clericalists were back in 1410. A bill was presented to the Parliament at Westminster. This bill was going for a knockout blow against the clergy. It was called the Disendowment Bill and proposed to do just that, strip the church of its land and property. The bill even estimated the potential revenue and the benefits to be derived from bringing down the Roman Catholic Church in England. However, the bill has disappeared from the record and so followed one of the most curious periods in English history. In 1413, Henry IV died, and Henry of Monmouth became Henry V. This man, Shakespeare's Hal, the wayward hijinxing lad of taverns and stews, deserted his bosom comrade and military commander Oldcastle, and transformed himself into a seriously minded king, with ambitions not only to rule England, but to rule France as well. Well, as they say in the modern tongue, who saw that coming? Who put such thoughts in his mind? Who offered him full support in his quest to invade and conquer France? Who offered the finance to facilitate this young king's dream? Well, it was the very organisation that had just been threatened with disendowment, the Roman Catholic Church. So Henry packed his travel bag and along with several thousand soldiers prepared to cross the channel and invade France. Just as he was about to leave at Porchester Castle, the so-called Southampton plot was revealed to him. It was a conspiracy to dispose him and replace him with Edmund Mortimer, the Earl of March, that is to say, the Earl of the Marches of Wales. And who was the ringleader behind this plot? This man, Sir John Oldcastle himself. The stories of Henry V, Agincourt, Joan of Arc and all the rest are many and long since told. But in short, Henry V proceeded to invade France. It was initially a success, but in time the English were kicked out. The armies came home and started fighting each other all the way up to 1485, when Henry of Richmond won the Battle of Bosworth, became Henry VII, and so ended the Civil War, known to history as the Wars of the Roses. So was the Church complicit in creating events that embroiled England in a war or wars from 1415 to 1485, as a ploy originally designed to deflect attention from the anti-clerics and their confounded laws of preminer, provisors and disendowment. Maybe, and for 70 years, that attention was deflected. But by 1514, preminer was back, and this time it was back to stay, until 1967 which then leads us directly to Henry VIII the Reign, an old tale of wives.